so good to be in the house of the Lord together, isn't it? We're so thankful for this. And I want to say thank you to our worship team. Thank you, Roman and Melissa and Thais, and just giving us these moments that we can engage together with our God. And they've been practicing all week long and getting ready for tonight. So I want to say thank you to that team. But I also want to say thank you to several of our other teams that make everything happen tonight so that we can actually keep our focus on the Lord and worship him and bring him our best gifts. So I want to say thank you to our production team. They've been working this week to get ready for tonight and our media team who's making everything happen and broadcasting live stream and to our kids team that are right now with our kids, uh, not just taking care of them, they're taking the time to teach them and to train them about who God is and his love and his salvation. So I want to say thank you to all of those teams and to our amazing First Encounters team. I didn't forget you guys who serve us so well, host us, welcome us, gather the Lord's tithes and our offerings. And we couldn't focus on the Lord if it wasn't for these amazing teams. So I want to say thank you to all of those amazing people. And if you somehow aren't on one of those teams and you would love to be on one of those teams, come and let us know after the service and we'll plug you in to the right people, the right places and make that happen tonight. We'll connect you to the right people. So uh, Pastor Chad is traveling. He's actually right now traveling from uh, Italy back to Israel. He's just finishing up a a three-week tour and uh, he sends his Greetings to you. He'll be back with us this next Sunday night. So I'm greeting you, King of Kings family, from Pastor Chad. Welcome. It's so good to see you and be with you. And, uh, and then I want to welcome some special guests that are in the house tonight, the, the Asian team that are here with us for the 11-11 that starts tomorrow. Our Kingdom Inheritance Jerusalem uh, team are hosting 50 hours nonstop prayer for the salvation of Israel. And they start tomorrow. And uh, we just want to bless you guys and say thank you for diving in there. And if you think of them throughout the week, let's continue to keep them in prayer because they're going to need it as they're diving into 50 hours of prayer. And uh, so that's our announcements for tonight. But I want to invite you Uh, King of Kings family, come and join us on Wednesday night. We're going to kick off our discipleship classes. It's only six weeks long. And now I need to say this very clearly. We don't do this just to add another thing to our our calendars. Our calendars are full. We don't need another thing. We do it because we know that we grow better when we grow together. We need you, and you need us, and we need one another, so that as we dive into God's word together, something happens that's powerful and special that doesn't happen when I'm doing it on my own. It happens powerful and special when we're together in community. Now, we're going to have food, because food has to go with fellowship, amen. So we're going to have a a nice dinner so that you can just dive in, eat, 5.30 to 6. We'll have fellowship and food, a great meal together. I want to say thank you to Ula, who's working behind the scenes to put those meals together for us. At 6 o'clock, we're going to have worship. Our worship team will lead us in worship, and then we'll dive into two different classes, one or or the other. You can't do both at the same time. So you'll get to choose one or the other classes. And we have two great classes, universal bestsellers, the books that are mentioned in the Bible, and what do they mean for our lives and how do they impact us. And then the art of parenting, where we're going to gather some new tools and brush up on some of our old tools for parenting our most important disciples our children. And so parents come on out. We're going to have childcare available the whole time. So spouses come out. If your spouse is acting up, you can stick them in childcare and uh, they'll be taken care of till the end of the night. And we'll have a great time together. And uh, we encourage you to do that. Okay. So I want to throw up on the screen there, uh, media guys, media team, our first picture. My son, Joshua, is one of those collectors of memes. So those memes are little funny pictures with funny sayings. Is that picture coming up? Can you see it? Isn't that great? (laughs) It's coming. Hang in there. So Josh uh, is always showing us these different memes. And 
we sit around, we laugh about the memes, and we think that they are so funny. And then this week, we're sitting together. We have a, a father-son time together, and he shows me this meme. He pulls out his phone and shows it to me. And it's coming. Is it not going to be there? Okay, so imagine... <laughs> imagine a flatbed truck with three piles of dirt and sand. Boom, boom, boom. Am I describing it well? There it is. So he shows me this picture, and I'm sitting there, and, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm, I'm like, I finally I look at him like, Josh, I don't get it. Well, what's so funny about it? Dad, come on. You don't cover up sand and gravel with straps. Oh, that's a good one. I started laughing. That's really good. That, that's a funny joke, but it took me a few minutes to get it, and I know some of you also didn't get it. Come on, because you couldn't see it, right? But all of us know that this is the better way to do it. You guys can throw up that second picture. This is how it should be done, right? A tarp or a plastic covering over the sand, the dirt, and then the straps. And the, the tarp and the plastic has to be side to side, top to bottom, front to back, covering up all that sand and gravel, strap it down, and now you can drive with confidence. Now, go with me in this uh, illustration. These two pictures, and if you guys can put them up side by side there, both of these pictures illustrate for us two different ways that we can see God's work of forgiveness is covering over our sins. For most of us, most of the time, we can understand God's covering for sin once and for all, like the truck that has the tarp on it. And it goes from side to side, top to bottom, back to front, and everything's covered. It's done. It's finished. It's complete. And it gives us confidence, and we're able to move forward. But sometimes, some of us, I'm raising my hand, feel a little bit more like the one with the straps on it. Our sin is exposed. It's not fully covered. We're waiting for the other shoe to drop for the bill to come due. And though we have tried to cover it with our pathetic little straps, it just isn't getting the job done. And so we don't have confidence to come before the Lord. Now, pretty much these are our two only options that we have, a place where we can land. We either embrace Yeshua's complete forgiveness, his covering of our sins, and by faith, we have confidence to enter into his presence, or we feel exposed and vulnerable and letting go of faith, we feel a certain lack of confidence and assurance. So let me ask you tonight, I'm going to get personal again, where do you tend to land? Of those two options, which truck is your truck? Where do you tend to land? And if I'm being honest, I'll say that I vacillate probably too often into this uh, lack of confidence, lack of faith, the two straps holding my sand and my dirt down, and listening to that voice, the voice of the accuser that says, you just, you're not doing it right, you're, you're a failure, you're, you're not doing enough, you haven't done it completely, that was sinful, and listening to that and not leaning into God's forgiveness, and many of us do that, because I visit with you, and I know where you stand, many of you, and this is why God has given us the book of Hebrews. This is the very reason, because if you've been following with us over the last several weeks, we're in this series out of the book of Hebrews that we're calling the GOAT, the G-O-A-T, the greatest of all time, where we find the author describing and demonstrating for us the many, many different ways that Yeshua is the greatest. He's greater than anyone. He's greater than anything that we've ever experienced before. And he's, the, the author is trying to get our attention back on Yeshua. Melissa, thank you for that wonderful worship tonight to get our eyes back on him. There's so many different things that we look at that we get distracted in and that we lean into and we rely on. And so the author is saying, get your attention back on Yeshua, everything that he's done for us, everything that it means to us and to our walk with the Lord, and he's calling us out, calling us up to quit putting our focus on other things, our, our hope, our attention, our trust in or on the temporal things of this world. And he's reminding us that all of these 
earthly things are only a shadow. They're not the real thing. The real, the eternal, the substantial is only found in one place. It's only found in Yeshua. And so he, he, the author goes on and he, he ex- explains that because of his work, because of what Yeshua has done, because it's so complete and so great, now we have confidence. Now we have hope through our faith in Yeshua and the work that he's done. Now we have a confidence that we've never had before. And now we're able to, listen to this, we're able to walk in relationship with the powerful, awesome, fearful creator, God. Now I need to interject something here because uh, as New Covenant believers, we're like, yeah, 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 I'm used to that. I'm used to that. No, I'm thinking of the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt and they're standing at Mount Sinai before the mountain and it's quaking and there's fire and blasts of thunder and a voice speaking and smoke and everything's rumbling and they say to Moses, get us out of here. Who can stand before God and live? That's who I'm talking about. That's the God that you and I are allowed to have relationship with. So we have confidence now to step into relationship with that God. And because of everything that Yeshua has done, we have confidence and power to live a holy life, a separated life, the life that he's called us to live. We could never do it before. And now we can. We have the confidence and the ability to do the actual works that we've been created to do, the works that have been prepared for us to do with our lives. And so this is why God has given us the book of Hebrews. Because if you remember, we said last week, Hebrews is that book, uh, the author is like that guy that circles back with a group of hikers. And he comes back to the, the guys at the back, the stragglers there at the back that have quite honestly, uh, become a little disillusioned with their hike. And, and they've lost their way, and they're not really sure, why did we start this hike in the first place? And they've forgotten where they're going, and they just want to give up and go back to where they started. Man, I wish I had time to tell you this funny story about Hezekiah's tunnel. <laughs> Someday I'm going to tell you that story. And the author comes in, and he begins to explain to them, no, 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 don't go back, don't give up. Keep going. You can do it. You have what it takes to finish the path. This, this is the right path. And he begins to encourage them to stay focused because God has great things in store for them. Listen to these verses out of Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. He says, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. It's not going to just be sort of rewarded. It's going to be piles and piles of reward, richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will be able to receive all that he has promised you. Hebrews was written for the readers and for us today to remind us of everything that God has done and that Yeshua has accomplished that he is the goat. He's the greatest of all time. And to exhort us because of everything that he's done to get up and to get moving. So as we dive into chapter 10 tonight, go ahead and grab your Bibles or your devices. There's a couple of things here that I want to point out as we begin chapter 10. The author is cementing as he starts chapter 10, he's cementing some of the concepts and the ideas that he was talking about in chapter 9. So keep in mind that it was a letter. It wasn't broken into chapters. It was one uh, solid idea. So some of the things that we started to talk about last week, we're going to finish up tonight. He's wrapping up his descriptions, if you will, uh, of all of the different ways that Yeshua is the greatest. And then he begins to transition in, in halfway through chapter 10, and he's transitioning from exposition where he's describing who Yeshua is and what he's done and the power that it's given to our lives. And he begins to transition to exhortation where he's going to spend a lot of the rest of the time and the, the rest of the book. And he's exhorting and, and, and saying basically these words, therefore... Because of everything that Yeshua has done, in light of everything that God has accomplished, since this has been done for us, 
Since Yeshua is greater than all of these things, since we've been freed from the power of sin, let's move forward. Let's leave behind all of these earthly things. They're not really going to do you any good anyway. So let's let go of them and move on. And then we see something here in chapter 10 that we're going to actually pause to point out tonight. It's all through the book of Hebrews, but it comes up several different times here in in chapter 10. And and it's important for us to see that the author is speaking to his audience is you, you all. And so he's not talking to an individual person. He's speaking to the corporate body, you all. And so we see that many times uh, he is reading uh, to that that first community of believers, and it isn't in an individual letter. It wasn't even ever written to an individual, and it wasn't passed around and individually read at home. It was read in public to you all, and the author is trying to get the idea across to a corporate body of Messiah. It was never meant to be an individual concept or idea. So we see many times in the book of Hebrews the the phrase, let us, 13 different times he says, let us. Three of those are found right here in chapter 10. So he says in verse 22, let us all together, putting my arms around everybody in the room, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Verse 23, let us all hold on unswervingly to the hope that we possess, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, let us all, all of us, consider how we, we all, can spur one another back and forth. Now look around the room. Let us consider how we can encourage together one another, spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us all as a community, as a, as a family, as God's children, let us hold on to those promises that he's given to us because we, all of us, are not those who are going to shrink back and be destroyed. This is verse 39 in chapter 10. So his exhortation is to a community. It's not to you and you and you and me. It's to us. It's to us all. And the idea is that we grow better together. Have you heard that phrase before? So let us, he says, encourage one another all the more as we see the day of Messiah's return approaching. Let us all throw off everything that hinders and the sin that entangles us. That's chapter 12. And let us all not give up meeting together as some do. Yes, I repeated that twice on purpose because this is why we host discipleship classes. This is why we host discipleship classes, because we grow better together. Yes, you can grow on your own, and God's designed it so that we have an intimate, personal relationship with him, but God has designed it for true growth to happen in the the communal setting where we are together, worshiping together, eating together, praying together, serving together. That's where life happens. That's where eternal life happens happens. So it's important that we capture this because this is God's design for our lives. It's not Pastor Mike saying it. It's not King of Kings saying it. It's not just the church saying it. This is God's design. This is how he's created us to work. This is how he has designed his body to work still to today. The problem is that we're living in a world that promotes Everywhere you look, it promotes this idea that uh, the idea of the happiness and the needs and the achievements of the individual. God's design has always been about kingdom growth and it's always been a communal setting. Kingdom growth happens in a communal setting. 
I was thinking as we were worshiping tonight, and I'm going to go sideways here for a second, a lot of our songs are, are singing, God, you're my all in all. That was what the song was, you're my all in all. You, and without you, I'm nothing. We should be singing, God, you are our all in all. And without you, we are nothing. Our songs should be more we and us. This is why we host discipleship classes, because we, we all, cannot build God's kingdom by ourselves. God didn't design it that way. Too many of us worldwide, body of Messiah, too many are trying to build by themselves. And God has designed it that we build together, which means we're going to have to be humble, which means we're going to have to lay ourselves down, which means we're going to have to promote our brother or our sister, which means we're going to have to actually love the unlovely sometimes. It's God's design. It's where the rub comes from. It's what makes us polished and look like Yeshua. God's kingdom reality then is that when we run together, when we serve together and worship together and eat together, we'll finish the race together. And God's kingdom is grown. We're not meant to run alone. We never were meant to run alone. It's never been about me and God having our own thing. The author appeals then in a, in a communal appeal. We're in this together. Perseverance is a community endeavor. Independent, ind individual perseverance is also important, but communal pressing into the things of God in prayer. This team that's going to be praying for 50 hours, they're doing it together in prayer. That's where it's at. Encouraging one another all the more. That's where it's at. Because I need your encouragement. You need my encouragement. She needs his encouragement. We need each other. All the more as we approach the day of the Lord's return. And this brings us to our first key point tonight. The family of God, community life in Yeshua, is greater than our own personal needs and the happiness of the individual. I just stepped on somebody's toes. <laughs> community life in Yeshua is greater than our own personal needs and the happiness of the individual. And community life empowers us to fully embrace the life that God has called us to live for him. So you want to live the life that's pleasing to God, you got to do it in community because that's the way it's been designed. So the author begins chapter 10 by clearly stating, and this is verse 1, clearly stating for us that Yeshua is greater than the law. The law is only a shadow of all good things coming. Some of those good things are here and more are coming, but the law is only a shadow of those good things. It's not the realities themselves, he says. In verse 1 he says, for this reason, it, the law, can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Capture what he's saying there. We, under the first uh, covenant, could never be made perfect. Even though we were sacrificing year after year after year, it never made the worshiper who was wanting to approach God, it could never make them perfect. Otherwise, would they, the sacrifices, not have stopped being offered? If they would have made him perfect, they would have, been, they would have stopped being offered, for the worshiper would have been cleansed, finally, once for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices, instead of removing guilt, are an annual reminder of our sins. We're reminded of our guilt year after year because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sin and to remove our guilt. And so, our condition, our standing before God, as the author reminds us, before Yeshua's sacrifice, during the first covenant, our standing before God was that we 
were guilty with sin, and there was no way to remove it. We had no stain remover because those sacrifices were inferior to Yeshua's final sacrifice. It was like the straps over the sand and the dirt. It just wasn't good. It didn't cover the mess. So then the author describes for us in verses 5 through 14, we're in chapter 10, he begins to describe for us when all looked hopeless. When our hope was gone, we were standing there guilty with sin. We couldn't remove the guilt. Yeshua raised his hand, he offered himself and declaring to God in Psalm chapter 40, he says, you did not desire Speaking to God, God, you did not desire sacrifices and offerings. And with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you weren't pleased. Even though the law commanded sacrifices and burnt offerings, the the, the son, Yeshua, the high priest is saying here as he's offering himself, that's not what you desired. And it didn't please you. And a body... He says, you've prepared for me. So here I am. It's written about me in the scroll. It's written about me there. The the shadows are there. Every time you look back at the first covenant, all of the shadows of Yeshua are there from place to place to place. Now, every time we look at those shadows, we can't exactly see everything that's there. It's a shadow. But it's written about me, Yeshua says, there in the scrolls. And I... God, have come to do your will, my God. And by that will of God, the author says in verse 9, Yeshua ended up setting aside the first order of things, the first covenant, and successfully established the second order of things, the new covenant. And whereas before every day the priests had to stand and perform their religious duties, offering the same sacrifices day after day, again and again, over and over, never taking away the sin of the worshiper, never really removing their guilt, never making God's people perfect or holy. Now, this High priest, Yeshua, the one, the only one that was truly qualified and capable of being the high priest when he had offered his sacrifice, his body. He offered it one time for all, a sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And when he was finished, he sat down. This is what the author describes for us. He sat down, signifying as he sat down that the job was done. It was complete. It was finished. The tarp was all the way over the sand and the dirt. There was nothing showing. And signifying that he doesn't need to do any more sacrifices. And as he sat down, It also means that God was finally, fully satisfied with this sacrifice. Blood of goats and bulls was was finished. It couldn't do it, but this sacrifice, boom, done, complete. Nothing else needs to be done. And so Yeshua sat down. And so our standing... Today, before God, our new position after Yeshua's sacrifice, it's described for us right here in chapter 10, verse 14, the author describes this new position that we stand in every single day as new covenant believers. And he says, for by that one sacrifice, he, Yeshua, has made perfect forever those who were being made who are being made holy we've been made perfect as God looks at us 
We're still in the uh, sanctification process. We're still being made holy. But at that sacrifice, we were made perfect. Finally, our sin was removed. Our guilt was removed. We were able to stand before our God. And then he adds this caveat. This is the covenant that I will make with them in that day. I'll put my laws in their hearts. They're not going to have to do it out here anymore. Figure it out over here. It's going to be written right here on their hearts. I'll write them on their minds. Their sins and their lawless acts, I will remember them no more. Not going to remember them. They'll be there, but I'm not going to remember them. I am not going to remember them. That gives me confidence. Hebrews 10 and 19 and 22 The author says this, therefore, this is as he transitions into his exhortation, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have this confidence to enter the most holy place, place that you were never able to go before, because we have this confidence to enter this most holy place by the blood of Yeshua and by a new and living way opened up for us, Through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest still to today over the house of God, let us, y'all, let us all draw near to God. That's what we've been doing tonight, drawing near to our God. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. It's gone. If you're walking around in guilt, I do. So I know some of you do. We do, y'all. We walk around in guilt And it says right here that Yeshua's blood has sprinkled our hearts to cleanse us forever from guilt. We are made perfect before the Lord. Therefore, let us draw near to God. Unlike those who before us wanted to draw near to God, they tried to draw near to God, but they couldn't because their sin and their guilt separated them from God. And this brings us to our second key point tonight. And worship team, you guys can start making your way up. Yeshua's sacrifice, besides covering our sins, has also removed our guilt, making us perfect forever, allowing us now, now as we step into relationship with this amazing, powerful, awesome, scary God, it allows us now, by faith, with full confidence, the tarps over all of our sin, top to bottom, back to front, side to side, we're good to go. We can step in with full confidence and draw near to God in worship, in that most holy place where we could never go before. That's good news. That is the good news. And this is our new position. Forever, this new position as new covenant believers, a position that we need to know tonight that Yeshua created and provided for fully himself. But it's out there until we actually take the next step. It's a position that Yeshua created and provided for fully by himself. But it's also a position that we, we all together, we access it and we embrace it by faith. Faith being that thing that lays hold of what we can't see. We can't feel. We can't grab a hold of it. But we have faith. We believe God's promises that he'll write his law upon my heart, our hearts. He'll remember 
my sin, your sin, our sin, he'll remember that no longer. That we can now, with faith in all of these things that God has said he would do, with confidence, draw near to that powerful, awesome, fearful, amazing God. Charles Spurgeon, the great British pastor and theologian, says it this way, faith holds, upon, excuse me, faith lays hold upon the promise of pardon. And it does not delay, saying, this promise looks precious. I wonder if it's true. But faith goes straight to the throne and with it pleads to the Lord, here's the promise, God. Do as you have said. And that's our challenge tonight. And it's this faith operating in our lives. And we're going to be talking more about faith in the coming weeks as we dive into chapter 11, the faith chapter. It's this faith that makes the difference. Whether we see the flatbed truck with the straps over it. Guys, you can throw that picture back up there. It's this faith operating in our lives. That's not the picture. It's this faith that it allows us and, and makes the difference whether we see the flatbed truck with the straps or we see the flatbed truck with the tarp. Fully covered or barely strapped down. And it's this faith that gives us the confidence as our author describes over and over again in Hebrews to step into relationship with the awesome God. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for us. The ball is in our court. So for you non-English speakers, the decision lies with us. Yeshua's already done the work. It's completed. He has sat down. It's finished. Now it's our job, our right, our great joy to appropriate what he has already done. Too many of us too often spend our time looking at the truck that has the straps over it. We think that's how our lives look. That's how we look to God. Your sin's exposed. He's going to see your sin. And then we don't have any confidence. Can I encourage us tonight to appropriate God's work done, finished, and begin to see your life as God sees it, that truck that's covered over. <laughs> There's no more sin. Top to bottom, back to front, side to side, it's covered. Strapped down, finished. Now you can drive. Amen. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We're so unfaithful. Fill us tonight, God, with faith. The faith that can't see what it believes, that faith that grabs a hold of things that it can't see, that faith that comes from the power of your throne. Give us faith, God, again, to see ourselves through your eyes. Give us confidence again, that faith-filled confidence to walk with you to fellowship with you, to be that man and woman of God that is here to accomplish your good works. Yeshua, we pray this in your precious name. Amen. As we wrap up our time together tonight, our, our prayer team is going to be down here in front. This would be a great time to pray. If you're vacillating like I do, back and forth. You just can't see that tarp covering your, your sin. Let's pray into that. Our, our team will want to pray with you over those things. We're going to worship 
and then Chris is going to come and close our time together tonight. And let's see ourselves through God's eyes. Amen.